the projector. I just get excited every morning. Hey, hey, hey. Turn it on. You can have lights on, you can see it. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Hank and I are sitting there, there's something different. What is it? I'm not sure. All right, new projector. It's pretty awesome. Uh, before I get started, uh, I have a request uh, from, uh, from Georgia to our church. If, uh, if anybody would like to help financially with, uh, with the situation, uh, talk to me. Okay? We, will, we will take a love offering after church. We'll have a basket at the end there. I hope you can find a basket there, of course. If you want to give something on your way out or later on this week or whatever, talk, talk to me. But uh, there seems to be a need, so we want to do the best we can as a church to, to help out with that. So I just want to bring that to the church this morning. Also, board members, don't forget there's a board meeting at 2 o'clock today, okay? Didn't already know. But praise the Lord. Praise yeah. the Lord. You know, uh, we've been going through the book of Daniel. How many have enjoyed it so far? Yeah. yeah. All right. How many read chapter 8? Uh, don't be falling behind here because... You're, gonna, you're not going to know what's happening when I get up here on Sunday mornings because you haven't read chapter 8. And I can't spend, there's so much in these chapters that we can't spend time going through. We've got to hit, hit some of the nuggets. But it's important to explain what's going on here. Because if we don't really understand what's going on and how it's told to us, it's hard for us to understand what God's trying to tell us. What lessons can we learn today about all these different things? Strange looking characters that are happening uh, now. And as I told you, from chapter 7 to chapter 8, it's, uh, the, the, the scene is getting more fierce. And it's getting more focused. And, it's in, and that's, we're going to see that again, again this morning. But, uh, you know, we thought chapter 7 was strange. If you read chapter 8, you're probably thinking, wow, it's even stranger than chapter 7. What is going on here? And why, why does God use these? I guess that's a question I had even beginning the series, is why does God use these strange metaphors, these strange symbols and pictures of things to help us? How, why does he do that to show us? Why can't he just come out and tell us what's going on? And as I studied this, uh, he doesn't want to confuse us. Some of us think, well, he just wants to confuse us. Well, he doesn't want to confuse you, you know. But what he does is he, he has to communicate over thousands and thousands of years to, to different cultures, different languages, different, different people, and he wants everybody to understand it. So he uses uh, these symbols and things to help us understand. And let me give you, let me give you an example of how this, how, how this works. Is over this generation, let's say over 2,500 years, let's say in the, in the future, 2,500 years, if you wrote this, if you wrote in 2006, St. Louis beat Detroit in the World Series. Who would understand what you're talking about 2,500 years from today? No one would know. No one would know. No one could understand. And what I'm trying to get you to understand here is why he's explaining these in metaphors. Not that we care about who won or not. That's not, the, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, is how, how, how can we understand what we're, what we're supposed to understand. Yeah. And if we say 2000, the, 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 the Cardinals beat the, the, the Detroit, or simply Detroit in the World Series 2006, nobody's going to know. And probably nobody cares either about that particular statement. But to make it clear, if we're going to use that little statement, here's what you might say that somebody 2,500 years from today might understand it. Listen to these words. In the sixth year of the reign of the second bush, the mighty beasts did battle. First among them was a tiger who devoured bush, or devoured all his foes, until only a cardinal remained. And the cardinal, with fierce swings of his back, vanquished the tiger. See, 2,500 years from now, they might have a better idea of what you're talking about than Detroit beating St. Louis in the World Series. And that's how God's trying to explain uh, prophecy in the future for us. See, a lot of what we're reading is history, but there's also some prophecy in it for us to understand. And that's what God wants us to know this morning. And it might, it might sound strange, but there's a better chance somebody 2,500 years from now understanding it. I got another one for you. Let's see if you guys can get this one. See if anybody can get this one, okay? After these beasts... There appeared an on-branded horse 
The horse had a lone star upon his forehead and was led by a seven-foot German. Against him rode the king of South Beach and his mighty but smaller accomplice was weighted at his side. The king and his accomplice triumphed over the long-branded horse and the accomplice was found to be the most valuable. Anybody have an idea what that is? I know what you don't. That's a 2006 NBA championship. And Wayne Wayne won the champ, won the most valuable player. The, the king, the beast, was Shaq. Yeah. You know? And that's how, that's how it all happened. So I'm trying to get you to understand how God is trying to speak to us. And why it might sound strange, but there's a better chance if we really start looking into it and really start breaking it apart a little bit, we can get it. But it's not going to be plain to our side. We have to understand how he's trying to communicate to us. And Daniel 8 covers an area in the Bible. Have you ever wondered what happened between the Old Testament and the New Testament? Have you ever wondered? Or did you just think it just went, just flowed right on? Okay? It didn't flow right on. There's about 400 years in that, in that span. And those are the 400 years we're going to talk about this morning. That's what Daniel 8 is about. It's about those, actually, I think 338 of the 400 years are right in there. And that's where this tribe or these, these group of people called the Maccabees were, were, were organized, a little, a little group that, that got together up in the hills. And I think it's one of the first times where they did guerrilla warfare. They didn't send big troops in to, in to take over. What they did is they got little bands of troops to go in and do damage, little by little. And that's what Daniel 8 is about, is about, about the, the, the prophecy of the, of the Maccabees and how what they did, you know, uh, winds up with the timing that God that God talked about, and we're going to we're, we're going to explain all this this morning. So the Maccabees lived 400 years after Daniel, and the Antichrist is yet to come. And God God gives Daniel visions of both for us, uh, both both past and future events, so that people towards the end of time would have confidence in what was yet to come. And that's been our that's been our our, our song through this whole series is that heaven rules. Amen. And last week, or two weeks ago, we talked about no matter what happens in your life, no matter what you're going through, no matter how trouble it might be, you're on the winning team. And you guys remember how, how you know, I, I love recording games and watching them, but I love knowing the score before I watch it. <laughs> because if I know the score and we win, I can sit there with confidence and just have fun. I don't care if we fumble or if we do something stupid, because I know we win. And that's what God's trying to do with us here. We win. Right. There's going to be trouble. There's going to be stuff going on. But we win. So have confidence in it. And hold on to God as you go through it. And that's what he's talking about with us here this morning. I mean, after all, you know, God, I mean, just look at all the prophecy just that we've gone over so far that has been completely accurate. It hasn't even been a day off. It's been right spot on with what God said it would be. He does the same thing this week. So let's look at the dream. This is the dream that Daniel had. I hope your Bibles are open to chapter 8. So if they're not, find one in your pew, get it, open it up, because we're going to go through some of the verses here. And this whole chapter is about a, a ram attacked by a goat. Now how strange is that? A ram attacked by a goat. Both have multiple horns, and the horns eventually take center stage in this drama that we're going through. And during this time, it was Belshazzar as the king. Remember Belshazzar from a few weeks ago? He's the king which helps to reconstruct the date of the vision. And scholars think all this happened around 551 B.C., just to give us an uh, insight here. Daniel right now is about 70 years old. So don't think if you're 70 or over, you can't be used. Okay? Because you can't be. It proves it here. Chapters 2 and 7 taught us that there would be four world empires, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And today we're talking mostly about Persia and Greece. That's really the dominant focus in chapter 8. And the vision continues to come to Daniel during the first empire, and it concerns the second and third empires, which leads us to what happens in the fourth empire. But here's some key dates, just to kind of help us out, to, to get us back in line with, with where we're at in, in, in history. In 551 B.C., that's the date of Daniel 8. In 539 B.C., Babylon falls to Medo-Persia. In 331 B.C., Medo-Persia falls to Greece. And in 175 B.C., and excuse me for probably massacring this guy's name, but Antiochus IV Epiphanes, he takes over his nephew, 
We're going to talk about this guy. He's a mean guy. You know, he's, the, he's not the worst, but he's close. And in December of 168 B.C., the temple sacrifices in Jer Jerusalem ceased. And December 25th, 165 is the first Hanukkah. So we, we can look at these dates. We can go back and see how history lined up perfectly with what God said it would be. But what do these dates have to do with Daniel? Everything. Everything. And I keep, I keep saying this over and over, but all these dates and all these, these, these times in history, this prophecy, it all has lined up perfectly. And what it's telling me is that the future for us is going to be what God says it is. That's right. And we need to be ready. And we need to rescue like we talk, those, those ones that are, that are out there. We need, we need to rescue the ones that, the ones that are lost. But in order to understand the dream, we need to go back again and just identify some of the key figures again. Just so we know who we're talking about and who's who in this, in this drama. And once we understand the who's, the who is who then, then we can put together what God's, what lessons he's trying to teach us this morning out of this. So let's go to some of the key figures. The first is found in verse 3. So go to verse 3. And verse 3 tells us, I looked up, and there before me was a ram with two horns standing beside the canal, and the horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other, but grew up later. And this is a, a vision of Medo Persia. You remember how Persia was stronger than the than the Meds, and that's why one is longer than one is longer than the other. But there's some that grow out of that, and we're going to get to that soon. Then there's the goat in verse five. Go down to verse five. And I was, and I, as I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between its eyes came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. And that's the, the vision of Greece. And Alexander the Great here, he, he conquered so much in so little time that it was like he was just sweeping over the country. And that's why it was like with no feet. That's the, that's the vision. That's how God helps us to understand what's happening here. And then we have the longhorn. In verse 8, go down to verse 8, it says, the, great, the, goat, the goat became very great, but at the height of its power, the large horn was broken off, and its place, in its place, four prominent horns grew up toward the fourth winds of the heaven. He conquered so much in so little. This was Alexander the Great. And the thing is, when Alexander the Great died, he didn't have a successor to his kingdom. So there were four generals. There were four generals that, that kind of decided they were going to take over. And this is how we got the four horns in verse 8. They took over Egypt, Syria, Macedonia, Greece, and also Asia Minor. These are the guys that took over that. And this brings us to the most intriguing character in the whole chapter is the little horn. Who is the Antichrist? And don't confuse him with the small horn because we see the little horn rise up out of the Roman Empire. See, the small horn was the predecessor, and that, and we thought we thought the small horn was bad. But it's not going to be compared to what the little horn is. And we need to be we need to be aware of that. See the small horn, we go, go to verse, go to verse 9. The then came another horn which started. Small, but grew into power, the south and to the, and to the, to the top to the east and toward the beautiful land. It just grew and, and took over. And the small horn is bad. You don't want to meet its replacement, the little horn. And the small horn was Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes. That was his name. And you go to verse 23 and 25, and you can see what's see what's happening here. In verse 23, it says, In the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a stern-faced king, a master of intrigue, will arise. That's the guy we're talking about. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy the mighty men and the holy people. He will cause the seed to prosper and will, will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take the stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. See what happened with with, with this guy uh, Antiochus? He 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 went to he went to uh, Egypt to try to take over Egypt, 
and this is at 168 BC, and he couldn't, he couldn't take it over. So on his way back, he ordered 20,000 troops to seize Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. This is how mean this guy was. And they entered the temple and they erected an image of Zeus, one of the Greek gods, and sacrificed a pig in Yahweh's sacred altar. This was the ultimate insult to the Jewish people. He was just trying anything to get back. I'm just going to get even. I don't care if I'm going to get the purpose of my way. I'm taking them over. This is the worst he could do to the people there. He continued to unleash the troops upwards of 80,000 Jews and then tried to and then tried to the rest of the Jews to try to turn them into Greeks culturally or religiously. But he killed over 80,000 of them. Can you imagine that? 80,000. Before long, they had formed a force of desperate Jews to sneak in and out of the infected minor casualties time after time. So out of this came this little, little band of people who got away and went to the hills. And that's where we get the Maccabees. That's where, that's where they began to get these little, little, little groups together and to try to seize the, the, the temple again, try to get it back. And they spent all those years uh, doing that. And they earned the, 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 one, the one general, uh, Judas, he, uh, he assumed leadership of this rebellion, and he earned the title of the hammer. That's what they used to call him, the hammer. And that, and that means Maccabees in Greek. And three years after his father's rebellion, the Maccabees defeated the Greeks, took back the temple, and relit the menorah in the temple. So they say, God succeeds. That's what it tells us in his word. He does succeed. He wins. But you can imagine going through that? You have this guy just destroying everything in your way. You have a band of people who really are holding on to what they believe. They run to the mountains and they start gathering other people little by little. And they start taking it back until they get big enough to, to, to take little pieces out of it. Until they get, until they get back. And then they, they go in and they restore the temple. And when you look at the days and the times and the God's word, it lines up perfectly when they lost the temple and when they regained the temple. We're going to talk about that a little bit too. So go to Daniel 8.14. Daniel 8.14 tells us, He said to me, It will take 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be re reconsecrated. And that's that timing in there. And some people take... Take it as 1,500 morning, 1,500 evening, so 1,500 days, which is about, in those days, with the calendar they used, was 360 days per year, which is about, right about where, where they said the temple is going to be redone. But there isn't any real, real conclusions that I found. That's the closest one I found to what was happening there. But of all the commentaries and all the different scholars in this, uh, really had no, no really strong conclusions or convincing but they said the one thing they all agreed upon is that uh, that it would end and the temple would be restored. Again. And I think that's what we need to hold on to. I, I know people. I know people that I'm going to school with right now, and people are uh, 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 friends who uh, who spend so much time on the numbers in the Bible, and they're looking at these numbers and they're and they're and they're searching. This got to mean something, you know. Uh, how many times have we seen somebody say, "Well, you know." Uh, the second coming is going to be this date. You know? We talked about last week, the billboard signs we saw. You know, there's been there's been people that that, that that's try to place these, make these numbers fit into. Nobody knows, and we can get so caught up into. Well, you know, Pastor, I don't think that's right. Well, it might not be. Well, you know, I think it means this. It could be. What I'm trying to help with this morning is this stuff's going to be going on. I'm not sure where we're going to be with all this stuff, but I do know we win. That's right. And I do want to hold on to the to, to God because I want to be on the winning team. Yes. And that's what I'm trying to get you guys to understand is if you don't make your decision today to join the winning team, mm -hmm. then you're going to be destroyed. And that's, that hurts. That hurts me. Yep. When I see you guys struggle and not surrender. Mm -hmm. It hurt me when I saw when I saw Roger when he had questions to understand, but he was searching. And when he surrendered, God said, just the angels in heaven were just, wow. You know? And so some of us this morning are still, we just can't believe it. And I keep telling myself, how much proof do you need? How much, how much, what else can we do? And we've got to figure it out. you got to figure it out this morning. 
the, the story of the Maccabees can be read in what's known as the the uh, the uh, I'm gonna mess this one too. The, the Apocrypha Bible, this collection of books written between the, t the Testaments, 400 BC to 1 BC. If you want to read that, I have a couple of those Bibles in my office. I use one of them for study, and I've read those read those stories. What was the and, name of that again? Pardon? What was the name of the book? Yeah, it's spelled A P O C R P Y P H A. But here's what it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 11. And we need to remember this verse. We've been saying this verse almost every week. It says, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfilling of the ages has come. God right now is, is shaking you. He's trying to wake you up. My brother-in-law, he loves to tell stories. And he has so many jokes. I mean, you can't believe all the jokes. And every time he tells them one, I go, Dave, you know, I, I can't tell that one Sunday morning. It was good, but I can't tell that one Sunday morning. <laughs> so last night, he's sitting there at the table, and he's going, he was really struggling. I get it. And he told me this story last night. He said there was this man in downtown, and a big flood came into the, into the city, and, and he, was a, he, he had faith in God. And he was telling God, God, bring me a boat so I can be saved. No boat. But the guy ran up into the second story of the building. God, God, you know, uh, help me here, help me here. And he didn't know what to do, so he ran to the top of the building. You know, God, send me a bigger boat so I can get out of this mess. The flood's coming up like this, right? He goes to the, the top of the chimney. He's like, God, give me, give me, send me a bigger, bigger boat so I can get out of this mess. And finally, he gets so distraught because the water's getting all the way to the top of the chimney. He's yelling out, God, just send me a helicopter then, whatever. I trust in you, send me a helicopter. The guy ends up drown, drowning and dies. And he's sitting there in front of heaven, in heaven sitting in front of God, and, and he's going, God, I, I, I love you. Oh, why didn't you send me help? And God said, I don't know what I have to do. I sent you three boats and a helicopter, and you still didn't see it. And we wonder how many of us sit in church and we believe in God. But we haven't given it all to him, and he's trying to show us over and over yeah. over again, and we don't see it. It's amazing. You know, I was there before, and many of you sit here every week. Many of you have friends who, 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 who ask you the same question, or you see them go through the same things. Help them with this. Share the things you're learning to them. Show them the word. Show them the way. And that's what God's calling our church to right now, is to, is to go out. Talk to those the ones in our families and the ones that are, that are friends to us. I mean, look at this as a warning for us. That's what they're saying, and the word tells us that. It's a warning for us. We're going to verse 11. Let's continue on with our cast of characters here. In verse 11, it says, It set itself up, up to be as, the, as great as the prince of the host. It took away the daily sacrifice from him, and the place of the sanctuary was brought to load. So the prince himself here was God himself. And in verse 25 in the case that, that Antioch and, and Antichius ends up dying, but not by human power. I read one commentary, which I don't believe, but one commentary said that he was out riding his chariot and fell over and he died of an abnormal death, not of the, of the, of the fall, but just of something else. I, I, don't, I don't believe that, but I do, I do believe it wasn't natural causes. I believe God had something to do with that. God took care of him first because God wins. I do believe that. Amen. And then in, 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 chapter, in, in verse 16, we get to the messenger here. In verse 16, it says, And I heard a man's voice from, from you lay calling, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. And Gabriel's the angelic interpreter of dreams. He's telling the dream, interpreting it for, for Daniel. And there's only three angels specifically that are named in the Bible. One is Lucifer, the fallen angel, Michael, the warrior angel, and Gabriel, the messenger angel. And Gabriel's explaining this dream to Daniel. In verse 27, it says, I, Daniel, was exhausted and lay, lay ill for several days. Then I got up and went about the king's business. I was appalled by the visions. It was beyond understanding. See, David was the servant of the king. And so we have all these players, all these players in line. And, and, and Daniel hears the vision and he, and he hears the meaning. So what does this mean to us? What are the lessons that we can learn out of what we 
now understand that dream to be. What can we, what can we, what can we grab from that? And here's the, here's the things that I, that, that I took from it. The first is the Bible is very accurate in predicting the future. It is spot on. Test it. Try, look at it. You know, dig into it. Try to find where there's, a, there's an issue. There's not. In the dream, God raises up Persia. This happens 12, 12 years in Daniel's future. And he did that so, so people could see in that day that what God says is true. So the things that were beyond that, people could, could, could understand the dreams and could also believe in what, what was happening. And he gives detailed description of what happened over the next 383 years. And why does he do that? Why does God do that for us? So that we, living thousands of years later, can believe the yet to be fulfilled forces that will come true as well. Those things in the Word don't just skim over or think, no, that's not going to happen. It is going to happen. We just don't know when. We don't know how. We don't know how we're gonna, what part we're going to play in it. But one thing we do know, we're on the winning team. That's what I'm going right. to. Next thing is prophecy sometimes has near fulfillment and far fulfillment. So we've seen some of that in, in what we studied. It's almost like the image. You ever seen at, at dawn or at, at dusk? You ever been driving out in the mountains or towards the mountains and you see this the silhouette of the mountain? And as you get closer, oh, there's foothills there. I gotta go through all that to get. That's kind of like these, 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 this uh, prophecy. We only see the big part of it. But there's some things that we have to, that are going to happen before that happens. And that's what Daniel is trying to show us here. It's impossible to see those things until you actually get right on top of them. Third thing is, if the small horn was bad, the little horn will be badder. That's where I put it. The little horn's going to be worse. I mean, the small horn's devastation was limited to the people of Israel, but the little horn's devastation will rule and extend to the entire world, including us. We learn that in that lesson. Next, God's people sometimes suffer at the hands of evil, but again, not forever. Don't forget the message that's in this book. The, 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 the key that, that, that unlocks it all is heaven rules. Amen. Through it all, every book, heaven rules, which is awesome. In John 16, 33, one of my favorite verses, in this world you will have trouble. How many believe that? Amen. Amen. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Amen. We're a winning team. Yes. And I keep coming back to that image. I, mean, I, I really, when I, when I thought about that, I go, that's, that's exactly how I feel when I'm taping the game and I know the end. I don't care what happens. I can, they, can, they can be down by 50. Okay, this can be really fun seeing how we win. And that's how we should be with our faith. We should hold on to it that way. Because it's already been recorded. And it's already been told to you. All you got to do is believe it. Right. That's all you got to do is believe it and accept it. Next, there's a time to mourn and a time to get about doing the king's business. And this hits home sometimes for us. Ecclesiastes 3, 4, and 5, it tells us there's a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones together. When the bad news comes our way, no matter what's going on, you know, it gets us down. We're human. But there's a time you need to get back on your feet and get moving. Yeah. You look at this, look at this, look at this verse, the verse 27. I, Daniel, was exhausted and I lay ill for several days. That's how you feel when things just hit you, you know, like a truck. And things you don't realize are really going to happen, they just come at you. He was going to say, then I got up and went about the king's business. I have that highlighted in my life. Because I want to remember, no matter what happens, i got to get up and get back to the king's business. Because mm -hmm. that's what he called me to. I can't stay in that, in that hole, in that darkness. Yeah. He called me out of that. You know he came to me this morning and said, you know what, Pastor? We need to look at more of the positive things. They go, that's what I've been telling you for a year now. <laughs> we need to look at the positive things. All things good that are going around us. Don't get caught up in the black hole over here. Look at all the positive things that are happening. Not only for yourself, for the church. It's amazing what's happening. Even in this church, amazing things that are happening. It's, it's just, it's just uh, amazing. And Daniel writes, I was exhausted and only had to go for several days. And he got up and did the king's business. And often we, 
we push away depression and, and, and we don't we don't we, we need to get away from it. We need to push it away and get get, get going again. Not lay in it and just ah oh, why me? No, me, me, me. You and Daniel's telling us it's not about you. It's about how much Christ loves you. Right. About how much he wants you to share the love that he has for you with somebody else. Yes. That's what he's trying to get to us this morning. So how do we put this all together? How does, how, does, how does this make sense for our own life? Well, God gives Daniel his dream about kingdoms coming and kingdoms going and a bad guy who comes and desolates everything in a really bad way. He does all that for us. But what should we do with all of this? What, what do we, when we leave here, what do we do with it? We, we leave, well, that was good information. Now I understand what the dream's about. But if we do that, we lost. We didn't hear God's message. Mm -hmm. First thing is, you need to prepare yourself spiritually. Yeah. Are you spiritually ready? Do you got, I mean, if, if, if I was going to play Saturday for the Bruin football team, okay, and I wore a cardinal and gold jersey, I'd be kicked out. I need to be ready. I need to get my blue and gold jersey on. And some of us need to get our God jerseys on. And we need to, we need to suit up and, and get out of the stands and get on the sideline waiting for the coach to call us in. And many of you are standing by the sideline going, Oh God, don't call me. I can't. <laughs> don't call me. Oh, I don't know. Gosh, he's going to equip you with everything you need if he calls you. Come on, I'm not this good. God is, though. Amen. That's right. Man, he's awesome. And some of our friends and family, how many of you have a friend or a family member who's even outside of the stadium? Right. You need to get him a ticket and get him in. Bring him in. Go find him and bring him into church. Get him in the stadium. Amen. And God's going to call. And we have to encourage them to, to get in the game. Yeah. Some of you have worn the uniform and taken it off. Get it back on it. He's calling you. Okay, I'll get off that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm not sorry. Come on, somebody. You know, we need to be a person that that can stand the persecution that's going to happen. All right. That's already happened. And we need to have, be equipped. We need to be ready. I mean, it's like standing on that sideline, and you might think you're equipped, but and the coach puts you in, and you, correct for you forgot to put your shoulder pads on. You're going to get killed, or your helmet. you got to equip yourself with all that God has for you, and he has all the resources for you. But so many of us sit there, and we wait for God, so we stand there, okay, God, put me in the uniform, I'm ready. But we stand there, but the uniform's all around us. See, we have to go put the uniform on. He's not going to put it on for you. You need to go, that's showing him, God, I, I, every time you put a piece of his uniform on, I trust you, Lord. God, I'm with you, Lord. Whatever you want to send me to, Lord, I'm ready to go. And that's what he wants from us this morning. In Matthew 24, 27, it says, As lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. You don't know. I'll tell you the truth. Roger had no idea Friday was his day. You have no idea. Today might be your day. Right. We need to be ready. We need to rescue as second thing to rescue as many as possible. Go out there and get those friends. Get them in the get them in the stadium. And third, trust that what God says will come true. Finally say, okay, God, I'm tired of dealing with it all. I trust whatever whatever you say is right. Because it is. Don't, don't fuss over it anymore. I remember years ago, I saw an uh, episode of, of uh, Twilight Zone. I don't remember the details, but it was about this guy who was taking pictures from a Polaroid camera. And every time he took a picture of the Polaroid camera, would, the picture would be the future. So when he was looking at the picture, every time he looked at it, he would say, oh man, he started, what can I do to help me 
get better? What can I do to help me get ahead? And so he went to the horse racetrack, took pictures. We saw all the winning horses. And he did all these things so he can improve. We wonder how many of us would do that if we had, if we had that. Yeah. We have it. But it seems that everyone who's possessed with that camera in that episode died of a tragic death. No one was willing to use their ability to forecast the future for good. And some of you this morning may be making that same tragic mistake. We know Jesus is going to return. We don't know when. We know those that are left behind are going to go through the rapture or it may be terrible for them. We don't know all that's going to happen. We don't know. But he knows he's going to return. And a message like this should turn you into a, not turn you into a stargazer, it should turn you into a soul winner. A message on prophecy shouldn't make you smug in your salvation and make you a servant of Jesus Christ. And let me end with this, with this, with this passage. Because the, king, the king's business is to tell the lost and dying that there is hope in Jesus. In Mark 13, 32 and 34, it says, No one knows about the day and hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You don't know when the time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts the servants in charge. And each of which is assigned task and tells the one at the door, our job is to keep watching, to keep witnessing, and to keep working until Jesus comes. And we need to hold on to that cornerstone that we sing about this morning. Until he comes and be ready for it. Barbara, can we sing cornerstone again? Can we sing cornerstone again?